Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 15th Dean of Columbia Law School, Jillian Lester, and from the class of 1959, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, everyone sit down. Please sit down. Please sit down. <laughs> well, welcome, everyone. This is a truly joyous occasion here for Columbia Law School. Justice Ginsburg, uh, we are so pleased to welcome you here to have a conversation with us this afternoon in celebration of the 25th anniversary of your investiture to the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, and you can see, if you look at both below and above, that we are here in full force. Everybody is absolutely <laughs> delighted. I also want to welcome those of you, I'm looking into the space right now, those of you who are on Facebook and watching this by live stream, there were many more people who wanted to come to this event than could fit in this room, and so we have people both uh, virtually and, and physically here with us today. Justice Ginsburg, all of us know of your close connection to Columbia, which began, at least formally, when you transferred here after completing your first two years of law school at Harvard Law School. In many ways, you were coming home, having grown up in, Ber in Brooklyn. So tell us what it was like to come here to Columbia Law School in the fall of 1958. I had some trepidations because I had two years at Harvard. Harvard refused to give me a degree if I successfully completed my third year here. I didn't dare ask Dean Warren if I would get a Columbia degree because the idea of three years of law school and no degree from either institution was too much to <laughs> contemplate. But Columbia was very good to me. I was invited um, to the Law Review by, um, let's see, who was the editor? Wallace. And I received a Columbia degree, of which I am very proud. And every time that Harvard Law School asks me, please, won't you receive it? I have only one earned degree, and that is from Columbia. I do have an honorary degree from Harvard. So when you went to law school, did you have any idea that you would build a career in the pursuit of particularly gender equality, and that you would become a, a real trailblazer in that area. It wasn't in my wildest dream. For women of my generation, the challenge was to get that first job because most legal employers wanted no lady lawyers. And the few that were beginning to accept women wanted no mothers. And my daughter, who is in the audience, was four years old when I graduated from, from law school. So the challenge was to get that first job. Once you did, then you performed at least as well as the men. And so the second job wasn't, wasn't so difficult. So what, once you, well, you obviously had a little bit of trouble at that first, at that, at that first effort to get a job, and so then you went into the academy instead. 
the, the story about how I got the job, which I didn't find out till years, years later. Uh, Gerald Gunther, who was teaching constitutional law and federal courts here at Columbia, was in charge of getting clerkships for Columbia students. He called every judge in the Second Circuit, and every district judge in the Eastern District and the Southern District. And finally, he asked one who was a Columbia College graduate and a Columbia Law School graduate, uh, Judge Edmund L. Palmieri. He, he proposed that Palmieri um, engage me as his law clerk. Palm, Palmieri thought my record was fine, but he was concerned by not being available on the occasional Saturdays and Sundays. And so Ganza assured him that if I didn't do the job to his satisfaction, there would be a young man from my class who would jump in and take over. And so that was the carrot. And the stick, according to Jerry, was if you don't give her a chance, I will never recommend another Columbia student to you. <laughs> and so was it during your time as a clerk that you began to think about gender issues and, and gender rights as a, as a passion, or was that later? When I graduated from law school, it was pre-Title VII. There wasn't even an Equal Pay Act. So um, they were not the tools uh, to challenge discrimination. I think we mostly accepted it as an obstacle we had to overcome. But then, in the 70s, when there, there were the tools, there was Title VII and later Title IX, it was the first time, it was really the first time in history that you could break the gender barriers that were pervasive. And did you see how much has changed? I came here, I spent yesterday at West Point where the general who was in charge of the program was, her first name was Cindy. And there were many women at the school going into all kinds of fields that they couldn't enter before, including uh, the armored division. So it was, a very upbeat date for me to see the change. Yeah. Now, in 1972, you became the first woman appointed to the tenured faculty at Columbia. And it's really hard to believe that having begun to admit women about 50 years earlier, that it took that long before a woman became a member of the tenured Columbia faculty. Now, you weren't quiet about your views on this. As the, record, as, the, as the story goes, you said that it was no accident that it had taken so long. Oh, because so, the, the president of Columbia, was McGill, was asked by a, a reporter, so how is Columbia doing with affirmative action? And the answer was, it's not by chance that the two most recent appointees to the law faculty are an African-American male and a female. And so I was confronted with that statement, and, and so my answer was, and it was no mistake, that in all the years Columbia University has existed, there has been no tenured uh, woman law professor. So many out here in the audience have aspirations for a career ahead of them, and for some, they'll be entering into areas where 
people who've had their experiences are underrepresented. Do you have advice to others who are seeking a future in an in a area of the law or a, a career in which there's under, underrepresentation of people who've had their experiences? For, for one thing, there are no doors closed anymore. Anything you want to do in the legal profession, you can do if you have the will and are willing to do the work that it takes. And I've always counseled students, don't try to do things alone. Get together with people of a like mind, and you can shore up, shore up each other. So when you were a faculty member, it was pretty remarkable. You were not only doing the work that fills the days of, of most faculty members, teaching, doing scholarship, being a member of the faculty community, but you were also lawyering. You were a public interest lawyer, actively involved in public interest litigation. The panel that follows our discussion is going to explore some of that, but I'm curious to know, how did you balance these different aspects of your professional life? I mean, did you just decide that sleep was overrated? And did each aspect in some way feed the other? I had a group of students who worked with me at Columbia when I taught procedure and conflicts, and with Lou Henkin, constitutional law. But I also had a clinic where the students were assisting in whatever I was doing. And I suppose the most difficult one for some of my colleagues is was a lawsuit against Columbia <laughs> <laughs> with, with 100 named plaintiffs. And it was about the then T.I.A. Craft retirement, where the women got less per month, because on average women live longer than men. That was that was the excuse that was given, and also some added, and women eat less. <laughs> but I, I must say that my colleagues at the law school, even if they disagreed with the position I was taking. I, I felt secure in my position because I knew that they would back me up. And the prediction was if they give women the same retirement pay as men, all the men will desert the system. But TIA craft was such a good deal, that no one deserted it. <laughs> and today it's flourishing. So. Oh, but that, by the way, that was a, um, it started with a tea at Madame Wu's house. She was an outstanding chemist. And it was uh, women faculty members and women administrators were the plaintiffs. As it turned out, there was a case from California that decided the issue, decided it the right way. And so the, the Columbia suit did not have to go forward. My, my very first encounter as a faculty member, a feminist friend came to see me. And she said, Columbia has just given layoff notices to 25 maids and not a single janitor. So what are you going to do about it? <laughs> and I went to see the, the vice president in charge of business. He told me that Columbia was very well represented. And would I like a cup of tea? <laughs> the following Monday, there was a hearing on a preliminary injunction. The chief counsel to the EEOC came. To, to support the maids. The union switched sides, and Columbia was aghast. It was the union's contract that had these separate seniority lines so that every 
maid would go before the first janitor. The union's response was, yes, that's in our contract, but we can adhere to a contract that violates Title VII. <laughs> so there was Columbia all alone. And the happy ending was when Columbia got the signal that they couldn't lay off 25 maids and no janitors. They decided they didn't need to lay off anyone, that they would deal with the housekeeping problem by attrition. So I'd like to fast forward to the moment. Uh, there's a lot going on these days in the newspapers about the Supreme Court. We've been closely watching the confirmation hearings of the past few weeks. And during your own confirmation hearings, you declined to answer questions about how you would rule in certain cases or situations that might come before the court. You've been outspoken in your views about how the judicial confirmation process has evolved over time. Could you tell us about that and why you feel so strongly? Why I answered that I wouldn't preview what I might decide, because if I did that, then no doubt somebody would move to recuse me, because I had already expressed a view. But I tried to explain to the committee that a judge is bound by, an appellate judge is bound by the record. So the first thing we look at is what happened before the case came to us. Then we turn to the lawyer's briefs. So for me to give an off-the-cuff answer, this is not, that would be improper. But the committee, the Judiciary Committee, had a lot to work with because I had been on the D.C. Circuit for 13 years, written many opinions, and I'd written many articles. So any of that was fair game. They could ask questions about anything I wrote. So, so should a person who answered questions during their confirmation hearing recuse themselves from matters that they might later hear if they are ultimately appointed well, to the Supreme there Court? Would be, there would have been, no doubt, a, a motion to, re, to recuse me and how I would decide it is but it's, it's something that should be avoided. I realize that we are uh, out of time for our preliminary, our, our first conversation, but the panel has two parts. Following our conversation, we will be welcoming uh, a full panel to the stage. And uh, let me turn now to uh, Professor Jillian Metzger, who will join us on the stage, and she will introduce the panelists. Thank you very much for this conversation mm -hmm. with me, and I'll be back on the stage a little later to do some question and answer from questions that have been submitted by students from the law school. So thank you so much. Can I tell the audience that the chief in charge of this panel Jillian Metzger was my law clerk. And what year was it, Jillian? It was in um, 97, I it's October term, uh, 97, I believe, yeah. So a, a while ago now. <laughs> it was, so it was the year after the VMI case. It was the year after the VMI case, yes. When, when we came to the court, um, there were a lot of cases the year before ours that were sort of on the bigger ticket side, um, and um, I think our year was a little bit tamer, is my recollection. Um, but uh, hello, everyone, and Justice, it is just uh, an honor and a privilege to get to be here with you today, um, and with, the, with all of you, but also with our, the rest of our panel. So um, without further ado, I'm going to invite them out here. Um, uh, first, Alatuna Johnson, uh, my colleague and the Jerome B. Sherman Professor of Law here at Columbia. Lee Gallant, class of 1988, the Deputy Director of the ACLU Women, uh, Immigrants' Rights Project. And Nancy Northup, President 
and CEO, also class of 1988, but of the Center for Reproductive Rights. Thank you all very much. So, uh, Justice, you need, need absolutely no introduction, but I'm going to say a few words about the remarkable folks on this panel. Um, they are a truly impressive group of Columbia alum and Columbia faculty. I'm going to begin with Nancy, um, uh, who has been the president of the Center for Reproductive Rights um, now for 15 years. Um, uh, uh, CRR engages in litigation, legislation, public education efforts across the country and across the world in seeking to defend women's access to reproductive health services. Uh, most recently at the Supreme Court, CRR were the attorneys for Whole Women's Health and successful uh, in Whole Women's Health uh, challenge to requirements that Texas had imposed on abortion providers um, uh, with the court ruling that those were unconstitutionally burdensome. Uh, so Nancy, welcome. Uh, Lee um, uh, is, as I mentioned, Deputy Director of the ACLU's Immigrants' Rights Project. I think that conveys to you that he's been a little bit busy recently. Um, Lee has argued and participated in many of the major cases um, going on today. Uh, most recently, the family separation cases was also very closely involved in the travel ban litigation. Um, but he has participated in major impact litigation even before the Trump administration, um, uh, particularly involved in leading immigration and national security cases for years. So thank you, Lee, for being here. I should say, by the way, um, Columbia is lucky uh, not only to have Nancy and Lee as uh, graduates, but also to have them as adjunct professors. They have both taught and shared their wisdom and experience with Columbia students now going on years. So, um, And now, last but certainly not least, um, my wonderful colleague, Alati Johnson. Um, Alati is a nationally renowned expert in civil rights um, who engaged in uh, impact litigation when she was at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, she proceeded from there to work uh, for Senator Kennedy um, for several years before she came to Columbia. She writes extensively on civil rights advocacy. And in addition to being an extremely popular teacher of civil procedure, um, a, a, sub, a subject, by the way, I happen to know that Justice Ginsburg is also very fond of. Um, uh, Alati is uh, faculty co-director of the Center for Constitutional Governance at Columbia. So welcome, Alati. Um, and uh, I'd like to start us off, Justice, um, with a question for you. Um, you've been a trailblazer in so many ways over the years, not least your recent turn as a uh, movie star come Supreme Court Justice. <laughs> I have to say, I didn't see that one coming. That's, that's on me. Um, but it's, it's playing at, at this, well, l later today in the journalis journalism school, because at the end of everything at the law school, I'm going over to the journalism school to uh, participate in a question and answer about oh. the film. That's wonderful. Well, so there you know. That's where you're going to go after <laughs> we're done here. Um, uh, but, but truly, uh, your work for the ACLU Women's Rights Project um, in obtaining legal recognition of women's equality was really uh, trailblazing. Um, and the cases that you, you brought um, are now, of course, a core part of the constitutional law canon. I teach them. Every year I teach con law. Um, I'm sure many of them are very familiar to our audience, but let me just mention three, uh, three top ones. I'm sure the justice uh, would have others to add to the mix. But there was Reed versus Reed, where you successfully challenged an Oregon law that denied Sally Idaho. Reed. Right. I, uh, Sally Reed was from Boise, Idaho. Idaho. I'm sorry. Idaho. <laughs> um, see? That many years later. <laughs> And she was denied the ability to represent her son's estate um, simply because she was his mother rather than his father. Um, and that was a seminal case uh, uh, in women's equality. And then you had Franchero versus Richardson, which I believe you probably talked to the general about at, in West Point, mm -hmm. um, a challenge to the military's policy of denying husbands of female military members benefits that 
the wives of members received. It wasn't just the military policy. There were statutes uh -huh. that provided. It was Sharon Frontiero married a student, college student, and she applied for the housing allowance mm -hmm. that married military members received, she thought, but they were available to male members, not female. Right, right. And that was statutory. And you also challenged uh, statutory restriction in the Social Security Act, right? With, um, it was the same kind of difference. And, and well, the most compelling case was Stephen Weisenfeld, mm -hmm. a man whose wife died in childbirth. And he vowed that he would not work full time till his child was in school full time. Mm -hmm. And he figured that with the social security benefits and part time work, he could just about make it. So he went to the social security office and he said, I'd like an application for child in care benefits. And was told, We're very sorry, these are mother's benefits, they're not available to father. So it was the same thought that the male is the breadwinner that counts a woman if she works is a pin money mm -hmm. earner. So she doesn't get any family protection. People a ask me many times, why did you take so many men's rights cases like Stephen Weisenfeld? But the discrimination starts with the woman, the woman as wage earner. She is considered a secondary earner, and therefore, and even though she pays the same social security taxes as a man, mm -hmm. her family doesn't get the same protection. So, so that's often identified your, your efforts to, to frame the case and to show the discrimination um, on both sides from gender equality rules is often framed as um, one of the st strategic choices that went on in, in, the, in the litigation. Were there other choices that you made or challenges that you remember really facing as you started to think about this line of litigation you were embarking on? There were, there were some things that we, we didn't take. I was thinking of it um, just yesterday when the young women were telling me that they were, their first choice was the armored tank division, a woman came to the ACLU office and said, I've just gone through tank training and I was the best in my class. And now they won't put me in a unit. Why? Because at the time there was a lawsuit against the military academies, West Point, Annapolis, the Air Force academies for refusing to admit women. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the Armed Forces Brass feared that if they put women in, in situations like uh, the Armored Tank Division, uh, then they would have a harder time defending their refusal to admit women to the military academies. And that was a case you decided not to... So we to didn't take the, her case because we thought it was too soon. Mm -hmm. Or oh, another one, one of my favorite clients, Susan Strzok, for another reason. Uh, she, her problem, she was a captain in Vietnam, and she became pregnant while she was there. At that time, pregnant was, it was called a moral and administrative uh, cause, mandatory cause for discharge. Um, anyway, Susan, Susan's discharge was waived. I won't tell the whole story about how that came about. And the armed forces changed the policy mm -hmm. so that pregnancy was no longer uh, an automatic discharge ground. And I called Susan to see if we could fend off a motion to dismiss the case as moot. Mm -hmm. And she thought, well, she said, I'm not. I haven't been denied any pay or allowances. Of course, I would not choose buying that Air Force space, but I can't say that, that that represents any kind of discrimination. 
And then she said that this conversation is taking place in 1972. There's one thing. All my life I've dreamed of being a pilot. But the Air Force doesn't give flight training to women. And we laughed because we knew in 1972 that was not a winnable case. Right. So, uh, so Nancy Lee, let me actually, that's a perfect transition to you. If you could, uh, maybe Nancy, you can lead us off. But thinking about um, describing maybe a little bit of the work that you do and whether you similarly think in your litigation efforts about staging cases or what are some of the other strategies and strategic choices that CRR and you are making in the, in the work that you do? So the Center for Reproductive Rights works both in the US but also around the world to make sure that reproductive rights are understood as fundamental human rights uh, by governments. And by that we mean that they are legally enforceable uh, guarantees and to the full range of reproductive health services to access to essential obstetrics care, to maternal care, to safe and legal abortion, to contraception, to assisted reproduction. And we work on it from a lot of different fronts. We do strategic litigation, we do legislation, we do fact-finding reports, we partner and uh, develop networks of lawyers around the world to look at this. And our strategic litigation is not just in state and federal courts in the US, but we also bring cases in the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights, the European Commission for Human Rights at the UN, through the treaty monitoring bodies. And in all of that, we have to think about what's the right case to bring when. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that's probably most similar to uh, the justices' experience in the 70s of how you bring along the women's rights cases was thinking about how we bring along the cases in the regional and international human rights bodies mm -hmm. on applying the human rights framework to women's reproductive experiences. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to rush in there with the first you know, case, but to start working on, uh, and in, it is now recognized in the uh, UN system, and particularly in the Women's Rights Treaty, that discrimination uh, against health care that only women need, which would be everything around obstetrics and preventing pregnancy and terminating pregnancy and caring to term, Discrimination against healthcare that women need is sex discrimination. Mm -hmm. And so taking things step by step um, has helped to develop the law in that area. Wow. And so it, when you think about, um, uh, that's one obviously sort of staging it step by step, thinking about the different venues and where the law is at. What are some other challenges that you are, the center is grappling with when it's embarking on a litigation? Well, one of the challenges is just jurisprudentially in the United States, we have the, still have the challenge that discrimination in terms of pregnancy is not viewed as sex discrimination in the United States. And so the Gedoldig case from the 1970s, the justice has written about this, you know, it stands as a big jurisprudential barrier. I mean, the other biggest barrier, I can't think of things that are, um, uh, you know, procedural or uh, that kind of thing in bringing public interest litigation. I mean, our biggest challenge is that we still are dealing with uh, sexism, mm -hmm. right, in American life. It is not yet the case, wonderful progress <clears throat> that the justice talked about, but we are not at a place where women have equal uh, social, political, and economic power. 5% of women are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, only 20% of the Congress uh, is represented by women. And even in the legal realm, while doors aren't barred anymore, we're only seeing at the top Firms where Columbia Law School graduates go, 20% of equity partners are women. So, and we're still dealing with hashtag Me Too movement. We know we're still dealing with discrimination everyday life for women at all levels. So there's a lot to still work on. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say that and this very big problem in the jurisprudence about not seeing pregnancy discrimination, sex discrimination are the biggest do, challenges. Do you think that the, the court might come out differently in view of Gilbert, which it was Congress's reaction to this incredible decision that discrimination on the basis of pregnancy is not discrimination on the basis of sex, so Congress amended Title VII simply to say discrimination on the basis of pregnancy is discrimination on the basis of sex. So with that statutory decision in play, would the court reach the same decision that it did in Gedeldig against Aiello? An obviously excellent question to which you have much more insight than I do. 
I would say it actually does bring up a litigation question, a challenge that we have. Mm -hmm. We do plead uh, uh, equal protection claims of sex discrimination in our cases, and they don't get decided by the lower courts because they say if it's, for example, an abortion rights case, we're going to decide this on substantive due process and the liberty interest. So it's hard to get it engaged as a constitutional matter. Lee, what about, what about you? What is, some, describe some of the work that you do, but also some of the challenges that you face doing right. impact litigation today. Um, well, so I, I am at the ACLU, and I think probably everyone generally knows what the ACLU does. Um, and I specialize in immigrants' rights and national security largely. And, and we bring basics, what we think are sort of basic civil rights and constitutional claims for immigrants. Um, so one case that I'm working on now involves family separation policy, or what some people term zero tolerance policy, where families were coming to the border mainly to seek asylum, and their children were being taken away. Um, so we brought a national class action in San Diego to stop the practice of separating parents and children. The children were very young, sometimes less than a year, and to reunify all those families that are, are that are were separated, and so that's a type of litigation we're doing. I don't do, and we don't do really nitty gritty immigration type stuff, but more what I would view as basic constitutional rights cases, civil rights cases on behalf of the immigrant community. And to, touching on the sort of the challenges, and I think these are probably related to what the justice was talking about, but manifest themselves in different ways. I mean, so much of my day to day is thinking strategically about how to advance the law and how to bring cases. I think in the immigration area, I think there have been two really big changes that have affected how we go about that. And the first is that when I graduated Columbia, immigration wasn't, and immigration rights really wasn't that big a topic. I think there was very little of it at law schools. If you were going out to do civil rights litigation, you didn't really think about doing immigration work. And so when I started at the ACLU, there were very few players. And when we were deciding how we thought the best way to bring a case and advance the law, we could call maybe one or two other groups around the country who were also doing national civil rights litigation in the immigration space and brainstorm with them. Now, there are literally dozens and dozens of groups doing it. And so, and I think this is not just unique to immigration, but I don't know that it's the same in, in your area, in reproductive rights, where I think there are still less groups. No matter what we may think about the best way to advance the law and the strategic decisions about which case to bring, unless we can get literally 60 other groups in line, cases are just gonna be brought. So that really affects a lot of what we do now. If we're not gonna bring it, someone else is gonna bring it, and someone else is going to bring it, then maybe we should be involved. I think that's an enormous change for me. The, the, other, the other thing that's changed for us, and I, but this obviously transcends immigrants' rights and even the law, is just the advent of social media, cable news networks, that we really cannot do litigation without having some presence out there to get our, to get our narrative out there. Because if we don't, someone else is gonna put the narrative. And it also makes it very difficult to have a disciplined narrative. You know, I think when I started, it used to be you created the narrative in the court papers. That's what the court saw. Maybe there was a little bit of media attention. But now, the minute you file the complaint, there are cable news shows about it, there's Twitter, there's social media. And so controlling the narrative around a case becomes very difficult, and I also think that the number, of, it means that the number of players who, have, who see a particular issue and then want to jump in, it's automatic. And even, the, I think it even goes to managing expectations of clients because the clients in communities may be reading any one of a number of things on the internet that may not be accurate or raising their expectations about what a lawsuit can do. But I think it affects a whole range of of issues for us about bringing strategic litigation. And I wonder, you know, back in the justice's time, sort of how often she had to think about other groups bringing a particular case when she made a considered decision that this was the case to bring and not this case. And because and I've heard the justice speak about, well, you know, we tried to mitigate big losses in certain cases and bring it, whether 
you know, that she had to worry about that many other groups jumping in and filing a case she didn't think, she may have thought was ill-advised. Not only groups, but individual attorneys, once there was Title VII. Right. So the ACLU could never control litigation the way the NAACP Inc. Fund did in the old days, mm -hmm. when it really was, when Thurgood Marshall was the only, your only hope, and if he turned down your case, there was no place else to go. Right. So we, we had a problem of cases popping up that should not have been brought, but a private lawyer saw something in it. Right. Yeah. And Justice, I, I'm willing to bet you weren't really thinking in terms of social media when you were doing this. <laughs> but what about public education or, or trying to put forward a particular account narrative in Lee's words of what you were doing in the litigation? Was that something you gave thought to when you were? That was the kids? first effort. It was always uh, public information, legislation, and litigation. Public education was essential because unless there was a mass out there mm -hmm. that was fired up by this. Mm -hmm. Remember when we started out, the notion was if the law differentiates on the basis of gender, it's benignly in the woman's favor. It, it, it was such a contrast to race discrimination where it was obvious that it was hateful and odious. But there was the notion that the woman was on the pedestal and she got better treatment than the man. Mm -hmm. She didn't have to serve on juries. He did. Um, it, it was to disabuse decision makers on the notion that women were favored mm -hmm. by the law. So, and so there had to be public understanding that was something wrong mm -hmm. with, with that notion. Right. That, so that's quite interesting. That's a, maybe a flip side of this for you, Lee, that at the one hand, it's very hard to control the narrative, but having the mass protests also right. creates. Yeah, and, I, yeah, and I think it, it cuts both ways for us. It's much easier for us to get messages out. But on the other hand, I don't think we can control them as well, given how many places people can go and how many speakers. So I think there's a good and bad of it. And I'm not wise enough to know at this point how it will all shake out and whether it's ultimately good for civil rights litigation. I suspect it is good, but I think it makes our job much more complicated now figuring it out. Um, Alati, I want to bring you into this um, because you've thought and written about public in, uh, impact litigation from a broader uh, theoretical and advocacy um, perspective. So how do you see the landscape today having changed yeah. from the era when the justice was doing her path-breaking litigation? Yes. Yeah, so I, what I see is really resonant of a lot of things that people have been talking about already. One of the things that the justice said um, that was interesting about the women in combat scenario was that it was too soon to bring that litigation, right? So you still see the sort of traditional public interest advocacy where you think about what's the right time to bring the case, what's the right kind of plaintiff, and you chip away incrementally. Um, I think the uh, greatest recent example of that really is around um, same-sex marriage and the um, abolition of sodomy laws. Um, you see this incremental over decades chipping away um, at precedents using federal courts and state courts. So that model, I think, is still um, being used, but um, there are lots of landscape changes. I mean, they're the ones that Lee uh, just described in terms of the number of organizations, but I think in general, organizations are less rights creating. They are more defensive in a lot of the work they do. Um, uh, Lee and the Justice um, talked about um, media. And, um, and I think that does present difficulties of controlling media. I think it's interesting to hear that media was always part of the um, equation, um, even um, in, the, you know, in the 70s. Um, but I think it's much more so now, to the point where sometimes organizations are doing more organizing, more legislative work than they are doing litigation. And the most um, uh, powerful examples of that, or extreme shifts to that, are organizations that really decenter courts. Um, 
they think of most of their work as being around social movements and organizing, so you see that with groups around economic justice especially, and they just do litigation at the margins um, um, when they feel that everything else hasn't worked. Um, so you see those kinds of changes, which I think are responding to changes in the judicial landscape, but also responding to the limits of courts. Um, mm -hmm. Courts can't establish all the kinds of rights and protections that we, we care about. Um, and, um, and so people are trying to use a, a broader range of strategies. Although it, it, two points strike me from this. One that's interesting, because it goes back uh, to Nancy and the justices' discussions about Gedoldig and Gilbert, of how a court decision can sort of frame the options for advocacy, because of course in economic justice with San Antonio uh, versus Rodriguez sort of really shutting off a federal constitutional eco economic justice claim that may have forced these claims yes. to move in other arenas and decenter the courts, um, uh, whereas the very success of um, many of the, of the claims that justice was bringing in the movements allowed those claims to, false, to, to prosper, but as you were saying, lower courts are now going that standard route rather than letting you reframe um, the other thing that is just very interestingly coming up here um, is Congress, Justice. You started us talking about Congress and the role of Congress in, um, in, in thinking uh, about constitutional rights and, and um, uh, as a tool, Alit, as you were saying, in, in terms of, of developing um, an agenda. And um, uh, it actually makes me um, want to ask you, Justice, a question. Uh, as a, as a justice, because you've had one, uh, one famous dis, uh, dissent that I can think of where you said this is really for Congress to act um, in the Ledbetter uh, case, I believe. Mm -hmm. oh. The tagline was, the ball is now in Congress's court to correct the error into which my colleagues have fallen. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So, so, and that was it, was, it was, it was kind of a repeat of the Pregnancy Discrimination Act when everyone came on board on Lily's side. Yeah. And the, the Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act was the first piece of legislation that President Obama signed when he, he took office. Wow. So, Nancy, in thinking about legislation, um, uh, what kinds of legislative efforts do you, does CR undertake? And do you think federal only, or are you also thinking legislation at the state level and thinking about what's happening in that arena too? Well, we do both. You look for openings at the state level. I mean, right now there's a lot of activity around one of the, um, one of the real barriers to access to abortion services in the United States is the failure of Medicaid to cover because of Supreme Court decision back in uh, 1980. And so there's been a lot of movement at the state level, and there has been reform at the state level to pick up and mm -hmm. for states to decide that they are going to do Medicaid coverage. And so that's an example where you switch back to a state strategy if you can't do it federally. It's been really tough to get mm -hmm. Congress to reconsider its decision uh, in that regard. And there are other things like the Women's Health Protection Act is a piece of legislation we've worked on, which is addressing the access of uh, the crisis access in the states. Because so many states, despite even the victory in whole women's health, the restrictions just keep on coming. And it's time to have like a voting rights act for access to reproductive health care. It's gotten to the point where we have to have uh, something stronger than just going back to court again and again and again and playing whack-a-mole. So in that case, you've got states that are so recalcitrant, uh, you're not going to have them pass uh, legislation providing access. So we turn to uh, the Congress to look for that. Interesting. And this actually reminds me, Lee, of some uh, litigation that the practicum that right. Alate and I uh, co-taught at Columbia worked on with you last year where you, had, you were representing a county um, right. in Texas. Maybe you can talk a little about that. Right, and so Texas had passed a law called SB4, and we fortunately got help from you both and the great students at Columbia, and we challenged that Texas law. And what the law said was that counties and cities now had to enforce federal immigration law. And so it raised these very complicated legal issues and also difficult political and policy issues because 
a lot of big cities, as well as some cities on the border, didn't want to engage in immigration enforcement for their own reasons, even if it wasn't necessarily be to protect immigrants' rights. And then, obviously, a good portion of Texas wanted it, and the, the law passed. But I think that's one of, been one of the big changes for us in the immigration area is now, when I first started, is the state involvement. When I first started in the 90s, all the work was pretty much with the, against the federal government. And now you see the states playing both pro-immigrant and passing anti-immigrant legislation. And so a lot of the work now is dealing with the states, made direct suits against the states, but also the federal-state relationships. But I think the other thing that's been interesting is the states coming in to be on our side often and litigating. And that, that's another issue that I don't know sort of how much when the justice was litigating that states were involved in affirmative civil rights litigation. But that's been a change that I've seen over the two decades where we are now having states as partners, but also sometimes the states against us, but much more so than when I started. Well, that was Justice Brennan's idea when the court turned away from his view of things. He suggested using state constitutions to establish what he thought should have been established under the federal constitution. Right. right. And, and, and there is this very interesting, um, again, thinking about your point about Congress as sort of the Congress and the court as institutions playing off of each other, the states and the federal government as uh, institutions and some sense branches playing off of each other, and the institutional capacity at the state level as a, as a tool here. Um, what, what about that from, from what you see, Alex? Yeah, um, so something that circles back to what you said before is that there's more litigation happening, affirmative litigation in state courts because those roots weren't available federally, constitutionally. So an example of that um, is around educational equity. This is following Br Justice Brennan's invitation, right, that you didn't get um, a federal constitutional uh, uh, right to equal education or to protect people on the basis of poverty, but a lot of state constitutions have educational equity provisions. So you saw through the 80s and 90s a lot of litigation at the state level um, to secure various rights um, to educational equity, and that's just one of a number of areas. But I think another trend that you're really beginning to see that harkens to what um, we were talking about a moment ago about the practicum and doing work on preemption is that States are also places that um, there is a lot of work done legislatively that some people in Lee's position would see as curtailing um, particular rights, right? So there's been more investment in, in, in not just Congress, but legislative strategies at the state level to deal with questions like reproductive rights, as Nancy said, um, to some states are preempting when localities raise the minimum wage. Um, states are saying, locality, you can't do that anymore. Um, when localities are passing um, ordinances that are protecting people on the basis of sexual orientation, states are preempting that. And that's because some groups are also investing a lot in um, state legislatures and, um, and trying to, to get state legislatures to, uh, to um, adopt the policies that they want. And that's a, a big change, I mean, that I've seen even over the last, um, I don't know, 15 years since I stopped um, practicing was that uh, people now have to know state court procedure and, um, and understand um, these mechanisms at the state level. So, so another change um, that uh, you see um, when you take sort of a little bit of a historical overview, um, and this maybe dates back, I think, to the era of Goldwater and to the, to the sort of birth of modern conservative movement is a, Originally, a lot of this impact litigation was challenged as un undemocratic and um, court seizing power over policy. But one of the things that we have seen is that the groups that are seeking that have expanded. And there has also been a robust growth of conservative public interest groups bringing particular claims and um, uh, you know, pushing the law and the courts in an, in, in an opposite uh, direction. So I'm curious to see, does that impact uh, your work? Or do you have to think of not just about how the courts might be going, but what kinds of responses you might get from litigation on the other side? 
still in New York. It was, it was Justice Powell who then popped yes. and made that a popular idea. Yeah. And he used the ACLU as his model and said, we should have on the side to protect business interests, right. organizations like the ACLU. Yeah. And now they have proliferated. Wow. You they can have. just see in the, the green briefs, the amici briefs that are filed, how many organizations there are. Yeah, yeah and the whole amicus practice has really expanded quite a lot as well, right? I think even from the, even from the days when I clerked and you'd see the stack of briefs you had to read through and it seemed pretty big, I uh, hear it's gotten even, even bigger. Um, uh, uh, so, so you guys are doing those so briefs? Yes, yeah. we, we, we're not only, in the United States, we're not only suing state governments, but we also are now dealing with lawsuits that are brought by uh, particularly organizations using the, you know, Religious uh, Restoration Act saying that, you know, if you have a broad-based uh, rule, like under the Affordable Care Act, that employers have to provide contraceptions in the full range of contraceptives to their employees, that that's an infringement on religious freedom. And those, there's a lot of um, very active religious freedom uh, litigation uh, that's brought by uh, organizations mm -hmm. that uh, are not on the same side as broad access to reproductive health care. So that is absolutely true. And so it's a lot of like three-dimensional chess, I think, yeah, is that's what you what, said that's before, what I'm which is that it's coming from many angles. we have state and federal courts. We have moving between the legislature and uh, the courts. And we have both state governments and coming in on both sides. And we have public interest groups coming in on both sides. And I will say not just here, but internationally. Right. Um, we find that you know, groups that are based here are also groups that we meet abroad. Right. Yeah, I think we're, we're seeing the same thing. And how much those briefs matter from concern, I think, varies from the litigation. I think at the state, le it matters more because the states may not be aware of all the, the national arguments that are being made, and those groups will bring it in. I, it matters less, I think, to us when we're litigating against the Solicitor General, who's probably going to make all the arguments that they would make anyway. But it's definitely an issue. There's definitely more players to contend with, and they are bringing their own affirmative lawsuits, even in the immigration area. And I think for the states, the states, you have certain states bringing their own litigation, both pro and against, and so that complicates the landscape as well. So, um, I mean, I, I think you've written, Justice, though, that in some sense it's the, uh, it's the ultimate complement to the litigation model, um, that it is one that a variety of groups have found to be conducive to, uh, uh, you know, they, they, what, I think you said at one point, imitation is uh, a sign of a tribute to the to the to the model of the litigation. Is, is that right? Yes. Yes. I said to, you see, you should be highly complimented by that, but it's also uh, some of it is worrisome. Well, well, think, a, of, think of the way the First Amendment was used in the last term of court right. in the Abood case, yes. one, one example. It's, and I, in the funding, not the funding, the notices, Cal, the California law yeah. uh, about... The Becerra case? The, the crisis centers that mm -hmm. they had to just post a simple notice saying, if you are interested in contraception or abortion, the state will make that available to you, and this is the number that you should call, or this is the email mm -hmm. uh, address you should, you should contact. And that was attacked on free speech grounds, and the notion of force compelling people to speak. Right. Right. So, um, uh, so, so, it does seem as if the, the model was complicated when you were litigating justice and the sort of parts and pieces and venues have expanded. Um, this leads me to ask you all, what do you think's next? You know, when you look forward uh, and think about impact litigation as part of a rights advocacy strategy, and Alati, maybe you could start us off, what do you see as the, as the new horizons and the new issues and the shape this may take going forward? Yeah, so I think one, just um, touching on what you just said and we're just talking about, nobody 
you know, one group or movement owns the strategy anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of using the courts to articulate certain kinds of individual rights is broadly used across the um, political or ideological spectrum. And so you see, for example, robust litigation um, around um, issues like affirmative action, and they use some of the very same kind of tropes and modes of litigation um, that were used by um, traditional public interest organizations, like choosing very sympathetic plaintiffs and um, advancing a kind of broader um, public education message around it. So I, I think you'll continue to see that, um, that no one group um, owns it and no one issue. I think uh, it's gonna be used by a lot of different groups. I think there's some um, issues where impact litigation are gonna continue to be very important um, for um, groups that I'm gonna just call traditional public interest groups, um, like um, the ACLU and Center for Reproductive Rights, and obviously that's around reproductive rights, immigrant rights, but also um, uh, racial justice issues like voter ID, um, I think is going to be a very big issue on the horizon, and we are not gonna talk about issues that might be before the court, but um, I think just issue-wise. And then I guess a third thing I would say is that I do think that um, a core issue for a lot of um, groups on the ground has to do with economic justice. And it's not really clear what the role of the courts is gonna be in articulating some of those issues. I mean, many of those kinds of changes are um, about policy changes, um, um, that uh, we don't think of as implicating the courts, but I think the courts will be involved in some way. Um, I've already mentioned the preemption context. Um, when you know, democratic branches um, enact wage increases and um, you know, other <laughs> branches, um, say the state, say that you can't do it, um, that gets into court, right? Um, and I think there'll be other ways in which those kinds of questions are going to be um, litigated and maybe people will even push for certain kinds of um, of, of constitutional rights um, that implicate economic justice, like indigent defense uh, representation. I think some of these issues around bail um, reform um, obviously are um, gonna be in the courts. Um, so um, I see those economic issues as really coming to a fore more. And, and uh, Justice, do you wanna weigh in here? Do you think your, your court's docket of public interest litigation is gonna be shrinking anytime soon? I think I'm in that comment. <laughs> what about you two? Well, I would jump in and say, to, to build on what Alati was saying, is that I think the issues around economic justice are, first of all, percolating, and particularly those like the Center for Reproductive Rights that use a human rights approach to the work mm -hmm. in the U.S. Um, you don't start with litigation, because as we know, we don't have economic rights under our Constitution, but you begin with working closely with communities. Uh, having leadership from communities and defining uh, what the issues are, and, and maternal health and the shocking racial disparities on maternal mortality are an issue that we work on. And again, it's not something you litigate right away, but you begin to build that work and build that community and build that, um, build that normative framework. But then it does come in. I mean, we do file amicus briefs, uh, bringing in the uh, human rights perspective and the economic you know, rights issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, into our cases, and I think eventually, you know, I, there's actually, um, you know, one of the one of the things that I think will I am hoping uh, be different 25 years from now when we're having this conversation at Columbia is that the economic and social rights that are so important will be much more embedded into our law. Now, maybe some of that's going to come up through the state constitutional decisions, where you often can bring those rulings, but also come up from, as the world is, as we see other democracies under their new constitutions uh, recognizing these rights, as we have the international decisions on human rights, which include you know, we are parties to treaties like the Race Discrimination Treaty. The United States is a party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We're obviously a party to the Torture uh, Convention. And decisions are coming out even under the civil and political rights uh, sphere. Like we brought two cases against Ireland on the right to abortion. And um, those, those uh, economic rights are even working there. The, the, the Human Rights Committee at the UN used an economic rights analysis as well as cruel and humane mm. integrating treatment in finding for the Irish women that they should not have to leave their country to get access to abortion. So I think there's gonna be, as we also hope that obviously the individual liberty and the uh, equal protection sex discrimination <laughs> theories will come together. I'm hopeful that 25 years from now we'll be seeing more of that in our constitutional law. That's fascinating. 
Um, Lee, what about you? Um, I agree with bo both those comments. I, I think economic rights are going to be a, a big issue going forward. And obviously, I don't think there's going to necessarily be cases brought and say we have economic rights. But there, there are so many issues that implicate those, is those economic rights, uh, you know, whether it's bail that all the team mentioned or maternal health or all those. So I think those are going to be our big issues going forward. And the proliferation of the number of groups who do the litigation I think is going to continue. I think it's just too easy to know what's going on in the world and too easy to file a lawsuit. So I think that will happen, and I think it'll become increasingly hard to control the litigation strategy and narrative. And, and you know, maybe it's a situation where the more is better. I think we'll have to to wait and see. But I think it, make, it definitely makes it more complicated. And I think also just how much we we see about civil rights in the courts also depends on the area. I mean, one of the things about immigrants' rights is you can bring certain affirmative cases, but a lot of what you do is necessarily reactive, just like if you were doing criminal work, because there's always going to be immigrants who are being placed into deportation proceedings who are going to need defenses. And so whether or not we decrease the amount of impact litigation we want to do in the courts, there's always going to be that amount of litigation because your people are going to just like in the, if they're convicted of a crime, they're going to need a defense and trial and an appeal. But the same thing happens in the immigration area. The, the only other thing I wanted to just touch on about social media and I think how much publicity cases get now is the the one thing, and since we're here in front of mostly students, the one thing I do feel is dangerous is it sometimes gets to feel like unless your case is earth shattering and is getting all this attention in the social media world that's not worth bringing. And I would just say to students, you know, if you take one case, it doesn't have to be an impact case, it can be one case helping one person. And if you help that person, it's an enormous accomplishment. And to not necessarily get caught up in all the media blitz around cases, because it's very easy to think that if you're not bringing an impact case, that's getting all this social media buzz, it wasn't worth it. And the truth is there's only so many of those cases and to, to not lose sight of that because I do feel as if everyone wants to bring a case now that's gonna blow up the social media world. And that, that's a dangerous thing I think I see for young lawyers starting out in the public interest world. Um. <laughs> Justice, I'd I, I, I know that, that Dean Lester asked you a sort of similar question, but um, I'd love to get your advice to our students in terms of thinking about, um, off of the line Lee was, was talking about, in thinking about representation and a career in representation. Um, uh, any, any guiding uh, thoughts, given your experience starting out and, and um, uh, how much do you think uh, students can sort of strategize about where to go versus take the case that that presents an opportunity and see where see where it leads you? I've often said to law students, if what, all you're going to do with your law degree is uh, turn over a buck for a paying client, then you will be very much like a plumber. You have a skill that you can do. But if you are a true professional, you would use your degree to help make things a little better mm -hmm. for other people. And as Lee said, it could be on an individual basis. It can be something you're passionate about, mm -hmm. like if you really care about what's happening to the environment. If you do that, you will get a satisfaction that you would never get if you're simply turning over a buck. I, lo I love that line. On that, I think we should draw it to a close. And now it's, it's your all turn. So I'm going to turn it back to Dean Lester. So one of the most fun uh, aspects of the process of preparing for today's event was to invite students to submit questions that they would like us to ask Justice Ginsburg or the panel. So uh, some of the, I've been 
madly crossing things out while the panel's been going on because many of the questions that students submitted have just been addressed beautifully uh, and very eloquently by either the justice or other members of the panel uh, during the, the discussion that just uh, preceded. But there's still lots to talk about. So uh, let me do a follow-on question, I think, to some of the, the themes in the, really the penultimate topic about what's next for uh, impact litigation. And I, I just want to push that theme a little further. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, perhaps you hinted at this when uh, earlier when you raised a question about whether Title VII ought to be amended, whether we ought to be working on the legislative front. I, I, a student asked the question very directly, uh, do you think that impact litigation has a future in a, in a time when there's an often hostile judiciary? Or would you suggest other avenues? You know, should we just be looking at other avenues? And I'd invite other members of the panel to, 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 to opine on that as well after Justice Ginsburg offers her views. You can regard the, the legislature and the courts as having a conversation with each other. I think the Lily Ledbetter case is one good example of that. It failed in court, but it was very successful in the legislature. I mentioned earlier the Pregnancy Discrimination Act was a, and there was a court decision went one way and the legislature reacted uh, another way. So I think that's a healthy thing in, in a democracy to have a dialogue between the legislature and the, and the court. And I would say that I think that depending on where the Supreme Court goes over the next, you know, decade or so, um, we'll think about constitutional amendments. I mean, all this discussion of originalism has certainly gotten me to think about, perhaps, what it would be like to have a recent amendment with some recent uh, uh, history around that. And I'm also struck when I'm reading cases from other countries that have new constitutions. And particularly, I think about cases um, uh, out of Colombia where the court is able to talk about, we had a recent consensus on this because we just enacted this constitution with these provisions, and so we know in the case of Columbia, that what our Constitution cares about is the most marginalized people, and it's there to protect them. And so, you know, I think we're going to have some really interesting conversations about constitutional amendments in the years ahead. Well, remember that our Constitution is powerfully hard to amend. Everyone uh, who is yeah. involved in the effort to get an Equal Rights Amendment knows that. Or I am, I am living in a place where there is taxation without representation. Okay. Absolutely. I came into my career after graduating from college during the ERA countdown campaign and worked hard on that. And maybe I'm going out on my career the same way. We'll see. <laughs> Any other panelists on this topic? Well, the, the one thing that strikes me, Justice, and it's your language of conversation that brings it out. You know, from an academic standpoint, there have been a lot of um, criticisms of impact litigation, often. Um, uh, claiming it hasn't been effective, that it was really the legislative response that made the difference, um, or attacking it as un undemocratic and anti-majoritarian. Um, but those critiques, I think, f maybe take too narrow a slice and simply look, to the extent they, 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 they have merits even on, on these terms, but they, they look too much at the litigation isolation from the litigation as one step in a conversation or one step in a back and forth dialogue. Um, and when you broaden the picture, as you did with the idea of a conversation, I think it conveys a bit of a response to those concerns about this form of advocacy. So this is a question specifically for Justice Ginsburg. Uh, one of our students asks, what case did you find most difficult to decide, or have you found most difficult to decide while on the Supreme Court? I would mention that not a single case, not one case. I mean, we do the best we can, however dense um, the case. But the category of cases that has given me uh, tremendous anxiety since my first day on the court are the death penalty cases. Because if I were a if I were a queen, there would be no death penalty. And so then I, um, 
but I did make a choice that I would not do what Brennan and Marshall did. They said that death penalty is unconstitutional in any and all circumstances. I'm um, part of a, a collegial bench, and I try as best I can to move the law in the, in the right direction. But every one of those cases is, is dreadful for me, especially the 11th hour stays. Julian will remember those. It's the last day, and all the stops are pulled out. One of the things about death cases is that most of these people have abysmal representation at the trial, at the murder trial. And as they get closer to the execution day, their representation gets better. They have one of the, um, the centers representing them. I think if that kind of representation were available in the first instance instead of the last, we wouldn't have any death sentences. I have a, a quote that I tell my Fed Courts class justice that um, I should figure out if it actually is something that, that you have said, which is that um, uh, any, um, when you see a capital conviction, um, it's a sign perhaps of ineffective assistance of counsel. So another question for Justice Ginsburg. What has been the greatest surprise for you while serving on the court these 25 years? <laughs> A, a few surprises. My old chief, when he joined the judgment in the BMI case, I mean, <laughs> Justice Rehnquist I could count on to be a, a dissenter in the cases in which I prevail. <laughs> <laughs> but then he, he joined the, the judgment in BMI, leaving Scalia as the sole dissenter. And then when this man assigns to himself the decision upholding the Family and Medical Leave Act, and that was a very fine decision. Or when the, the old chief, having criticized Miranda up and down, I don't know how many times, and is confronted with the question, the frontal attack overruled Miranda, and he decides, no. So he's my example of as long as one lives, one can learn. <laughs> uh, so this question can be one that uh, everybody on the panel can participate in. Uh, what is one thing you wish you had known as a law student? Known as a law student. Justice, do you want to begin? <laughs> <laughs> well, Nancy and I were law students together, so I don't, do you have anything that I should have known back then? <laughs> we weren't just law students together. Lee was my note editor on the Law Review. And I suppose if I'd known that I was going to still be sitting with him, you know, 30 years later, that might be something. I mean, I think in general, I actually always tell law students this, your law school classmates will be your professional colleagues the rest of your life. Um, I think Lee and I did OK on that with our professional colleagues. But just remember, like, they, they may end up, if you want to be a public interest lawyer, they may be in private practice and may be very helpful uh, and supportive as pro bono. Uh, counsel with you. They may be on the bench someday. They may be in government positions. Um, so don't get all high-handed about you're going to do public interest law. Remember, these are going to be your colleagues, your professional colleagues, and treat everyone well. Well, I wish I had known that one day during my lifetime, women would be 50% of the law students at Columbia would have Jillian Lester as dean. When I went through law school, there was never a woman in the, in the classroom. And so to me, people are, people, some people are impatient because we haven't reached nirvana. But, but the, 
change is just enormous. Well, <laughs> I mean, I think for me it's um, more pedestrian. Um, I, I think when I was in law school, at times it felt like it was taking forever. Um, <laughs> um, and, um, and then when it was over, it just felt like it went by in a flash. And I experience that with my students um, all the time. Um, that first year just feels like, oh my gosh, I'm so afraid and it's taking forever. And then they're just graduating and there are all these things that people wish they had done. Um, clinics they wish they had taken externships, um, classes that um, where you get to examine the law critically in a way that you don't have time to do in practice. Um, uh, you know, going to events such as this. I mean, especially at Columbia, you get to take advantage of so many people. I think a lot of people in. took advantage of this event today. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> quality, just to be this, clear, this was not even close, right? <laughs> but I mean, uh, people march into that law school every every day for lunch, and um, and sometimes people say they're too busy for those things, and it's just no. This is the one time you're really going to have that. So I think it's just soaking up all of that learning uh, and um, interaction. And, and yeah, you get and I to think do. related to that, I think. I would have taken more advantage of the faculty and realized that I could walk into a fact and, and sort of there were so many people that were doing interesting things and probably done more of that had I um, not been so sort of blinded by just focused on the, what I had to get done and take advantage more of that probably. Uh, well, I would, I would definitely echo that, um, that uh, actually it, it, it really does brighten up our day when students come by um, and we get to meet new students and see what they're doing. But I would also add, um, realize that you are young and the, and your we life- we are not. <laughs> we are not. Yes, we are not. But also that your life in the law is long and you have a career that can when going into the law, it can open up a variety of different opportunities for you and experiment with them, see, see where your passion lies. Um, don't rush to have to get out and, and, and be on a preset path and don't lose the courage to pursue, pursue your passions and what drives you. So a uh, question for Justice Ginsburg. I think this might have come from a, a 1L. How many 1Ls are in the room? A lot of you out there. OK, so uh, do you remember the first time you were called on in law school? <laughs> <laughs> and if so, what was the case? <laughs> it was my first day in law school, my very first class. It was civil procedure. I had a superb teacher, Benjamin Kaplan. And it wasn't that I was called on, but there was a young man who was called on, and he gave a brilliant answer. And then he volunteered a few more times. And I came home and said to my husband, if they're all that smart, I'll never make it in this place. <laughs> um, that man was uh, Tony Lewis who was on a Neiman Fellow that year, and so he was taking, he took Paul Foreign's constitutional litigation seminar and my first year procedure course. So they, were, they weren't all like Tony <laughs> Lewis, but I, I said, the challenge for me is I will volunteer in class as often as that young man. So I decided that I wasn't gonna be quiet, I wasn't gonna hide in the back, hope not to be called on. Now that meant there had to be a high level of preparation on my part. I thankfully did not have a section that continued Ladies' Day. Lady Day was a, a professor who ignored the women for the entire semester except one day, Ladies' Day, announced in advance the women were sit, sitting, in, all of them in the first row, and they were called on incessantly. And there was something very funny that happened in, in Columbia. 
when I was teaching here when there was the great Billie Jean King, Bobby Riggs match. And a professor, I think he was from the business school, teaching a course in law school. And he announced to his class, well, tomorrow will be Ladies' Day, because he thought that that was, uh, that was a celebration of, of the women. He didn't know, <laughs> didn't know what the, the history of it was. Well, everybody, please join me in a round of applause for our panelists and for Justice Ginsburg. It's a wonderful panel. <laughs>